Today we are going to have a topical lecture. We are going to go over something that I've been seeing over and over and over and over and over again. And that is the Kobayashi. I wasn't fully aware of why we were going to see the Kobayashi in so many of our games on Taijem, for example. I took a break playing from Taijem today. Uh, one of the reasons is the last five games in which I was white, I saw Kobayashi played over and over and over again. Kind of annoying when the same thing is played repeatedly. So I'm like, you know what? We're not playing there. But I will do a lecture on it because it's apparently here to stay, especially since such wonderful players like, you know, my favorite uh, good old Koji, he sadly is also playing Kobayashi. And no, against Kobayashi. He's played games against Kobayashi lately. So I've been seeing it more. I'm now seeing it in professional play, which means I have to review it because you fine folks are probably going to be seeing it too. So like it or not, it's here to stay. Let's see what the Kobayashi even is, though. Kobayashi is this. Rather simple formation. Let's go here, here, here. Here we go. By black, this is the Kobayashi Fuseki. And it's really, really easy to get into because if your opponent plays on uh, upper right 4-4 four, four point, you might think to yourself, well, I could try to block it by playing this instead. But I I'm not a fan of this particular setup, just personally. I don't like having uh, this kind of weird... Uh, both my 3-4 stones facing... It's, it's just strange to me. It's, pr it's perfectly fine, it's just weird to me. And I notice a lot of other people uh, seem to also avoid it too. I don't like see a lot of this in games that I look at. Because uh, let's say you don't want to, for example, keep playing the same thing as your opponent. Kind of gets a bit awkward, because they're kind of ahead of you. Um, also, we don't see opening on the 4-4 here a lot, because it invites the diagonal, right? It invites this kind of game. So if you're not interested in the diagonal, once you see your opponent open up first move, you're going to think, bam, I'm going to grab this. We're not going to play diagonal now. We're going to play maybe a framework game or something. I don't know. <clears throat> so when your opponent plays this, and congratulations, you have no longer really have any choice. They can play Chinese. They can play uh, Kobayashi, whatever. It's really, really easy to back off into. Now, you could say, oh, that's fine. I always block this by playing here. Now, my opponent... I'm thinking, no, you know, better, let's do it this way instead. Uh, there, there we go, we have a 3-4 point. Now we can't actually do that, can we? See? Easy. Look at that. Can't, there's no Kobayashi, but unfortunately now our 3-4 stone is facing our opponent and that uh, brings with it its own little can of worms. This kind of hurts to play because how easy they can kind of develop between these two stones. And now we're back into Kobayashi again, and we're low on the left-hand side, and it's just uninteresting, and we're not interested in that. So it's really, really easy to fall into a Kobayashi setup simply because of un not playing unusual moves. So we're going to see it a lot. So the question is... Why do we play the Kobayashi? What is the purpose of the Kobayashi? What are the pitfalls of the Kobayashi? Do, does anybody know? Does anybody know what the pitfalls of this framework are? Because we all know what the Chinese one is, right? If we play Chinese, which is also a framework, a set Fuseki, if we play close, then the danger here is, oops, we are really, really tight. We're jumped into a pincer, and now it's like, how do we get out of that without really hurting ourselves? Look at all of these moves we have to play just to make sure we have an adequate base, and we can still kind of sort of be surrounded here later, maybe on. That's kind of a bummer. So this is, the fr this is like the pitfall we usually try to avoid with the Chinese. So what is the pitfall with Zikobayashi? Is J4 Kobayashi 2, you know, I'm kind of on the fence on if I want to talk about those moves, Saikta. Uh, we'll see how it goes. So Kobayashi, what is the pitfall here? Uh, let's see. Very easy option for a large bottom and a moyo on the right. Could be, could be, could be, could be, could be. Could be. 
Uh, developing the bottom is, in fact, one of the pitfalls. You are correct. If we play something as simple as this, for example, then our opponent can p do a no-brainer detachment and just the uh, development, right? Didn't require any thought. It's just, look at me developing now. And we can just develop that way, and we don't really like that quite so much, right? We could uh, play high, but again, we can still develop no matter what you want to do. We can still try and develop here. Uh, there's worse problems with this, though. If we play this, you might even get pincered. And now we're developing fourth line while pressure is still being applied to us. We don't want to push, push along the fourth line to other fourth line stones. So the question is, what happens with these stones? We don't really know. It's not very comfortable, so we kind of want to avoid these things. Again, same thing high. We could play something like this, but the jump out is just uh, not very nice. It's like, what What are we doing with this little string of stones that we've got played? Is this even sente now? Can we... Does, does, black, does black have to respond here? Can black play elsewhere? If so, are we getting anything in this location? Whole bunch of really, really uncomfortable moves. And we want to avoid all of that stuff, which is why usually in the Kobayashi, what you are going to see is a move either at A or B. Now, full disclosure, I do want to say that a lot of players, or a lot of teachers, I should say, will recommend playing the high because it's harder to get into a complicated variation here. I will note that's, that's true, but you do have to have the offset of that where you are potentially inviting fifth line territory for your opponent. Yes, it is. it avoided uh, complications, but that did come at a cost that you should be aware of. So if you do play that, maybe you're going to be giving away uh, some territory to your opponent. I mean, obviously, uh, one benefit, though, is you can play lightly on the right-hand side. We're going to settle easily. All that good stuff. Even if we give territory to our opponent. Send pay, send pay, send pay, send pay, send pay, send pay, day zoo, day zoo, day zoo, classy eating habits. <sighs> I have to edit that out of my video now, Ryota. Thank you very much for the donation, though. I think I'm going to actually have that muted for the remainder of the lecture. <sighs> Good troll, though. Good troll. So even... What was I, what was I even talking about? I don't even know. You just broke my train of thought completely. Um, right, invasion points. We do still have invasion points as a result of um, being of uh, black playing so high so that that's a thing to think about as well usually in professional level play and uh, even a lot of high down amateur games you're probably going to see the low approach a little bit better or a little bit more often simply because it avoids giving fifth line territory away now you might say but wait a minute that's not true. We can still shoulder hit here and get the fifth line territory. And you're kind of right and wrong at the same time. Uh, the shoulder hit here turns into an attempt to get a base, unless you do this, but then that just kind of like transposes into the whole fifth line thing that we saw uh, earlier, right? If you don't want to transpose into that, we're probably going to try to get a base. And now your opponent has two real options. We're going to keep pushing, or we're going to pincer at one of these points, which we're going to talk about momentarily. This one, I'm going to say, if you play on Taijin, and maybe even if you play on KGS, you might see this most often, because it's so uh, tempting to get for ourselves. Like, we're going to get a huge wall here. Right? I mean, oh my god. Look at the wall we just got. Isn't that amazing? We can even just like build here now. But what's the downside of playing this way? Why is white willing to accept something like this in order... No, I, that gives it away. Why is white willing to play something like this? I 
Anyone have any ideas? These territory is only in one area. That is true. Do we have any other truths? No solid points. You're getting warmer, Hikaru Pro. We're stumbling around the answer. White knows he has to reduce. I like where that thought's going. I like the reduction idea. I like that we're not having solid points yet for black. These are these are really good ideas. The fact of the matter is, if your opponent is trying to build up something this large, this is actually a move you can play. This works. It looks big and scary, however, and this is a good rule of thumb to like hold in the back of your head, if you find your opponent trying to build for himself a very, very, very large area. Like, look at me, I'm trying to build all this for myself. There's a really good chance that he's not able to. There's a really, really good chance that not, that's not secure. If you have like a really large area that you're trying to build in, if the if it was possible that that was secure and you couldn't reduce it, then we would absolutely never play things like this. And even little things like just a normal enclosure off a 3-4 point probably wouldn't be played quite so often as well if it was that easy to surround and, uh, and acquire for yourself that many points. So here, let me give you an example of how easy it is to invade this. If our opponent says we aren't going to go under his stone, then we have options for leaning still. You might say, but what about... That didn't work out as well as I thought it was going to. You might say, what about the ladder? Your opponent could then say, right. Um, what ladder? This ladder? That ladder right there? The one that doesn't work anymore? I, I did it again. Black player moves. So there's a lot of Aji in there. A ton of Aji, and something's going to have to be given up in order to try to keep it. Like this, you'll have to play here. And even that can still be given up, right? I'm missing all of my moves today. So, and even that can still be given up, right? So we're getting solid territory, we're getting influence. Black can obviously be reduced. It's not a very big, scary area. What's big and scary about this is the idea that you now have to do something about it. I think about this maybe entirely wrong, but one way in which I do think about this is... And this sucks because I've, I've never played chess. But... Like, even if you don't play chess, you've heard the expression... Um, or at least you know in chess you're like putting your opponent in check before checkmate. That's kind of what this is. Like, oh, I'm going to win the game right now if you don't reduce me. You should be able to reduce me. But if you can, I'm just going to win because, oh my god, that's huge. Right? So it's kind of like that. So in that respect, playing this against this kind of style of play can be kind of frightening. Because you know that if you make a mistake now then they got away with a little bit too much and you lost the game, right? So there's that. Uh, other idea is to pincer here. This is more honest. This says, you know what? I'm not going to try to build in Gote. I'm going to try and just fight to build. But this kind of leads to the same thing. Nope, not that one. It kind of leads us with the same idea where we can build and once again it's like oh my god we're not getting anything on the right hand side but it is because we can still invade that right if our opponent tries to kill it's really 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 tough to actually kill us it's incredibly tough to kill us if you're careful also 
full disclosure, it's also why a move like this is played by an honest player. A move like this is played by a very, very greedy player. And what I'm showing you so far are two common, are uh, some common sequences you're going to see in this. Ice is very often. This a little bit less. This one's funny though. This sequence here is funny. Because it's trying to build up in a different way. Only this one, I, I'm uh, least afraid of this variation out of all of the Kobayashi variations. Like if you see your opponent play here, I'm almost celebrating now. Because just by playing stupid moves and playing the Atari everywhere, you can find a really good variation for yourself. You lived in the corner in Sente, there are still invasion points here. Your stone's not dead. This is still potentially undercut. And oh my god, we've got Sente. So I do see this variation played a little bit in the lower right, but I'm not really a fan of it. Like I had never played this in my games because I just don't like this little clumpy, shapey thing that we made in the middle. What can you do when he protects against the invasion at M5? Can you still reduce enough? Protect against the invasion at M5. Yeah, because it's... um. Let's go back to that. If we played this, and we go into this, but not that, and we see here, this is still an invasion point. This very, very common invasion point is why we see a lot of players using the Kobayashi um, arguably incorrectly because you protect one invasion point but the other one still exists. Now I do want, in the interest of full disclosure, I do want to say this is not necessarily a bad way of playing. Uh, arguably you could play against, you could play this way and just keep building. Like, you know your opponent's going to invade, you know he's going to reduce you at some point, but maybe the idea here is, I don't know, we're just going to keep trying to build up over here now or something, and we're not completely set on the area in the bottom right. I mean, that that can still be a thing. Okay? Of course, the downside about it uh, does go back to the fact that we are building up only in one area, which arguably is not always a good idea, ever a good idea? It's not always a good idea. Sometimes it can be. Sometimes it can be, I will admit. But not always. With M5 there, there are 20 plus of territory, no escape, so invasion might not work. Um, no, you're fine, right? If we play here, and you play this one, we're good. Right? Because we can't be denied life. We've got that. Um, we've got this. I mean, we're we're gonna we're not we can't die. It's not possible, right? And don't be afraid if your opponent plays something like this to play it immediately. You don't have to invade immediately, mind you. Um, let's just go and change up the order of these moves a little bit. Let's just say this was played high. And now we're going to play something like a this because this was a 3-4 point. Like, we don't have to drop what we're doing in Invade. Like, if we got a framework, we could feasibly, you know, continue building off our framework. We don't have to drop what we're doing in Invade. What we're doing matters too, but if we're not really doing much of anything and we're just kind of playing solidly... Not really developing a frame, we're playing a territorial game. Then we can go ahead and invade this right immediately after the defense of M5. It's it's okay. Um Right, so we got the clump one. Da -da 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 -da. We had the clump one here. Uh I do want to point out, if you're playing against a Kobayashi, I do recommend going in this variation as white. This, this one in particular here. Uh, when the pincer is played, I'm noticing this is the most common one played among professionals, which I was surprised about. I thought it was a different one. 
I thought it was like one of these variations was the most common one, where we just go out and then we make a little bit of shape local. But apparently I'm wrong. Apparently I am in fact not right about that one at all. Um, if you are playing against someone that does play this way though, I do want to point out that you don't have to play passively and just like submit and watch your stones be attacked. You don't have to do that. You could poke and then strengthen yourself here because now we're threatening this. Which is pretty amazing. Now we're on the seventh line. Pretty good deal. So this gets protected against. We get to defend. Everyone gets shapes. Shapes for everybody. All good. So that that is a possibility to play to be played. Um, other possibilities are um, this uh, in and of itself is also possible. But as long as we're willing to just make shape, we should be pretty okay. The important thing here is not leaving yourself vulnerable. Like, if we just play away right now, we're going to have issues. Because there's no really great way of getting shape now that the bottom is protected and we're being poked at. Like, as long as you avoid that, as long as you avoid that greed, and some people do fall into the habit of leaving this shape alone because they just don't want to like even here they'll sometimes like leave shapes alone because they don't want to really make certain that they're nicely protected but then you know they comes back to haunt them um i do want to point out this one though this one's probably one of the easiest as black because all you're going to do here is either push your opponent into this. A little bit of a base. And then we're going to poke. Like, hey you, what are you up to? And he'll be like, not much. Then you'll be like, okay, I'm going to play elsewhere then. But if you poke here, and they're like, what are you up to? And they're like, I want to surround you. So that's why, I make it, uh, that's why I make myself nice and strong. Then you protect. And then they have to protect. And then you'll notice that... Contrary to the smiley face you see on the board, this isn't really a, a perfectly happy position to be in for white. Because like all of these stones are just kind of capturing the one. So we don't really want it. It's solid, but it's not the greatest. Um, this is another possible, really popular one too. Uh, wonderful thing about this is, let's say you had the idea to make a framework in your game at some point then playing high really helps that because we're getting extra influence in the center, right? Now, the downside, I'm not even going to say. I am not even going to say the downside. Does anyone know the downside of playing this way? Can anyone tell me, is there any downside to playing this way? There's a little bit, little bit of a downside. A little bit of a downside. In exchange, in Go, generally speaking, Whenever you want to get away with something a little bit more, it's going to come at a cost. So what is the cost that we're giving up here in order to get away with something just a little bit more? Just a little bit more. Not really slow. This is faster than uh, this move, right, Ry right, Ryota? Right? Play a little bit faster? Easily undercut, so says Sync Pet. Uh, true, but the opposite is also true. The fact that you're looking at that base is the right idea. It can be undercut, so our opponent might have to respond to us. That is absolutely true. But, irritatingly enough, it can also be kept low. So if your opponent's really into the whole, look at me, I'm building strategy, then 
they can kind of get they can kind of really really build like if they're willing to give up or to give you some extra points they can really really build up here right so that's the downside of extending further there's more forcing moves against that group right so that is something that we'd have to consider Being attacked, though, obviously is uh, an idea as well. And at that point, you know, you can just play here and it's okay. I mean, black's going to protect. Or if you wanted to play a bit more territorial, I have seen this one as well. I think this one's aimed more at just trying to get a more of a solid position here. And maybe being able to attack here. Because you got, like, the undercut there. Or the connection underneath there, sorry. Are we learning to play against Kobayashi? We're learning to play against, and we're going to learn to play with the Kobayashi as well. Right now, we're looking at some of the common pitfalls that you can fall into when you're playing against it, because those are more commonly seen. And by learning the pitfalls, we're also learning uh, some of the more common variations that you can use with it. So, yeah, it's kind of back and forth. Um, what else would I want to show? Uh, I guess that's, that's just an extension. I mean, you can, you know, see attachments here, obviously, also as well. Um, the downside of playing this variation, though, is a lot of them are really obvious. They really, really are. Like, if we play this way, we know we're going to jump out, right? And if we jump out, we know our opponent's going to are going to probe. And if we probe, we know our opponent's going to respond. And if we respond, we know we're going to give Sensei away. And if we get Sante away, we know we're going to respond. And they're going to develop. And then if you're going to if they're trying to develop, you know you're going to approach. And once they're approached, you know they're going to try to play aggressive against you. So the next couple of moves are... You can pretty much guess what they're going to be. They're really easy to follow. Right? It's hard to say, you know, I did not know my opponent was going to do that once I played there. Because it kind of just like flows into like a single line. Which is why I usually play something a little bit different. It affords me a little bit more opportunity to play, play here. Or... Double Kobayashi, best Kobayashi. I'm kind of like stuck. I'm at war with myself right now. Like I, I think in the back of my mind, mentioning at least one trick variation here is a good idea. But you're probably not gonna see it. Should we go? Should we like show the trick variation? Anyway, you probably won't see it in your games. I saw it in one of my games, and even then he got it like wrong. So I'm not sure if he was actively trying to play a trick or if he just was screwing up. Yeah, K three is you know, quote-unquote, the trick. I can promise you, almost every time, there's no way they're doing this intentionally. A lot, if, like, if you're a Q player and your opponent plays here, and now that I've told you it's a trick, you shouldn't, like, be there getting all angry at the board, like, oh my god, he's trying to trick me. Chances are, he, he probably doesn't know better. But there are some tricky things here. Like, if we play normally, and we pincer normally or abnormally, let's say. And we're like, well, I guess I'm just gonna play a variation like this now. Cause this is Jiseki. And... I've been messing that up all day. Then this is a problem. Looks complicated, I know. Cause it kinda is. I mean, we can go here, we can go here. 
Looks fine, right? But the problem is, this actually runs to K3 now. Which is why it's a trick. Without K3 on the field, you can't play this way. Because you've derped really, really hard. You can't just keep playing these stupid jumps. You need to connect to something in order to kill the corner, right? So with this low, well, we've just connected in one move. So technically, you got into a trick. But I... You're so... The, the, the chance of you seeing it is so slow. And I feel bad even mentioning it because I know some people are going to watch this and be like, I'm totally playing that in my next game. And bad on you for thinking that. But yeah, there is technically a trick there. Technically, there is, in fact, a trick there. Because you can save yourself with the attachment. And yeah, you can't when this is high, but you can when it is low. So to avoid anyone trying to be yucky and trick you, you could just go ahead and play here. Granted, you can approach high, that works too. If you approach low, I might just on reflex. This is still okay. Because it's really, really easy to, uh, like, get decent shape with this attachment. Like, if they go in here, we can do this. And we've got light shape. What should white do to punish black for playing low, low, low? Yeah, you can, you can do a bunch of different things. You can just go and play here. Uh, if you do play this... You can attach here and just get shape. Because, I mean, if we go into even to this variation, right? We don't care about this. I mean, what's white trying to do? What's black trying to do, sorry? Is he fighting tooth and nail to get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 times 2, 20 points of territory? That's not good. I mean, that's 20 points of territory minus Comey. Great, now it's 14. Now what? I mean, this is pretty much punished in and of itself, which is like a simple shape. And all you gotta do there is just make a simple shape. And that's pretty well punished. Now, one thing you don't want to do with this, though, by the way. Like, I mentioned how A, B are common here. Please don't play the pincer. This pincer is actually very dangerous. A lot of players know there's a Giuseppe with pincering here, and it's so easy to screw up. Like, if we play this and play a reasonable variation, well, a quote-unquote reasonable variation, then we see that these stones here at K4 aren't really happy anymore, so why did we pincer? That's the problem with pincering. Usually when we're pincering, we're saying... I, I just don't really know where my territory is coming from, which is why I pincered. And sure enough, if we hoped it was on the bottom, but we pincered, oops, no more territory on the bottom anymore. That's just gone. I mean, you can try and play things like this to get more reactions out of your opponent, but you're just a base trying not to die at this point, right? Um... This is common, which point you just kill this and play elsewhere. Do just go about your business, or play locally, I don't really care, that's fine too, I suppose. But either way, you can see that the K4 stone's not being used very effectively. Now the danger is, some people assume all pincers are created equal. So I've seen a few people try to get cute with their pincer, and they pincer one too far away. And then they go into that variation, thinking, all pincers are created equal, you've got to play this, and now I'm getting a little bit more. This works perfect formation, I'm doing amazing. Unfortunately, no, you just resigned the game. Oops. Because with that pincer one farther away, and I saw this... 
I feel like I saw it today. Did I see this today? I did see this today. I think so. Yeah, it was in one of my games. Um, yeah, the push here is no no good. Because this is, this is not supposed to work. The whole getting rid of all of our liberties thing. Yeah. But, uh... Problem is... This isn't supposed to kill black, but now it does. Because that pincer was one too far away. I mean, the bottom is nice and strong, you can see that. But now there's just nothing we can do here. This is just dead stones. Right? No amount of fancy footworking is getting us out of this one. So that's dead. And that doesn't actually work if you pincer closely. You don't want to pincer far away when you're dealing with this kind of thing. And you definitely don't want to pincer with a Kobayashi at all, but if you do, don't pincer far away. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Because how that's supposed to go is this way. Nope. And now there's no way to, like, Hane here and not be a dead man. So the corner's dead. So those are the most common variations that I've shot to you really, really fast. I probably shouldn't have done that in under, 20, in under 40 minutes. But those are the most common variations that you can see with the Kobayashi. So now the question is, well, how do I know what I want to pick? How do I have any idea what I what, what I want to do here? And a lot of this really amounts to you, like what kind of game you want to play. Like you can play the Kobayashi and still say to yourself, you know what, I don't really want to play an influential game. I kind of just built the framework to make a framework. I, I'm kind of leaning towards playing territorially. How, how do I do that? And then you can think to yourself, well, either I play on the third line for territory, or I play on the... Uh, what is this? The fourth line for influence. It's, it really amounts to like that simplicity. What line are we going for here? So it depends. So that's completely up to you. You can play territorially and you can select the variation that goes that way or you can play for influence and select that as well. Um, if you play the, in the territory variation, you know what to expect. You know they're going to play here or here. Didn't Kobayashi develop the opening to be territorial? Maybe, however, you can take it influential if you so feel inclined. In fact, if you play against the Kobayashi, like I mentioned, chances are someone's playing it for influence and not for territory. Like, they're going to play here, and then they're just going to do the whole buildy, buildy, buildy thing, because this really looks impressive. Like, look at all of that influence. It is amazing. What if he ignores and invades right away? You mean, don't approach, just invade? This? Is that what you mean, Ryota? Is that what you are talking about, Mr. Ryoda? After A, okay. So we play this, he plays there, and then he goes boop. Okay. That This is actually pretty easy. This is actually the easiest thing you could ask for. This is great. This is amazing. What we have now is this game is just broken into fundamentals. One plus two. Don't let them connect. That's it. So we can play like a, the world's most passive move here. As long as we don't let these connect, we're going to be in good shape. That's all we really have to do. You can do it however you want, just don't let them connect up. Just split the two, just split two groups. You're good to go. Now what gets really weird here and one of the reasons why I wanted to mention this 
is we're seeing a resurgence of this now. And I blame our favorite boy, uh, Kaji. It's his fault. He's been playing this in his games. It's irritating that he has been, but he's coming up with new moves. For example, when you play here, you might say, well, I, 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 I remember lecture. I'm just gonna, you know, pincer, and then we're gonna go into here, and then I'm gonna kick, or poke, or whatever this move is, and then we're good to go. But, um, mm, yeah, about that. Pros are annoying, and they keep creating new variations. Like this one. That one's irritating. You can see the idea behind it, right? If we play low, we might be playing low for a very, very long time. Right? If our opponent plays something like this, then we're just, what are we gonna do, connect? Like play something like this? And then suddenly they're getting influence? And suddenly we're low? Bad news, man, bad news. He's getting shape and we're low. And I wish I could offer you encouragement that there are easy variations to avoid your opponent trying to keep you low. I really wish I could. Because, like, you can see this, for example. This would be the ultimate horror. Right? If you played this and suddenly, oh my god, I was just tricked. I'm on the first line now. Sadly, I'm kind of not playing this now in some of my games because I don't like this variation. This variation tends to lead to all sorts of complicated things. I'm going to go over this a little bit more detail probably in a future game because there are at least two games uh, in which uh, Good Old Koji uh, did play this variation, so I'm probably going to go over both variations in a future lecture. So I would just recommend not playing that one right now. Either stick to a closer pincer if you have to, or play here if you have to, or just play here if you have to, and just develop this way. But I've been avoiding this one on the off chance they play here. What if B just plays P5? That gets dangerous too! All these are dangerous. It's not quite as simple as that. Because one, they can split you, and now you kind of need to respond here. Because you don't want these stones to get under attack. Especially considering this thing is not completely dead yet. At the same time, we don't want to respond here and allow this to be played, because this looks pretty easy to respond to now. There's a whole bunch of nastiness here. But just thought I would point that out, because this is one example of where uh, openings evolve. Usually we would be teaching 100%. The approach close like this is not a good idea, and you probably want to play a move like something over here, or something over here. Take it from me, that's what I learned. But apparently what we learned is evolving. There are variations being developed around this, they're extremely fighty. So I just want you to be aware of that if you decide to play Kobayashi. It is possible your opponent plays low, or plays uh, closer, with the intent to fight. So, fair warning. Enjoy that. Um, <laughs> but if all goes well, your opponent will probably play here. You can choose between A or B, and now you should have a fairly idea 
of how to pull, of how you can play. That's not how I wanted to play. Oops, technically we can get away with one more move, can't we? Doop, doop. You have an idea of how you can play. You know what's greedy. If you see what's greedy, you know that you can invade this. Or you could even treat it extremely lightly if you wanted to. But you can, in fact, reduce this. Just know you're probably going to have to. Kind of sucks, but that's the breaks. If you want to play it for territory, or for influence rather, you know you can extend. Just beware you are playing a very greedy game with, that is leaving a lot of potential open for bad things to occur to you. Um... Is there anything else I wanted to show that's really, really common? Um, hmm. I think those are the most common variations that I can come up with. Did that. We did the extend. There's one other one I guess I, I want to mention. There might some there might be some old schoolers out there who play this one. This was like a really big thing a couple of years ago. And I I'm in love with the idea behind it. Like the idea that we don't want to just like play unnecessary moves kind of had R3 being a thing for a while. The idea that like, you know maybe this is just giving our opponent shape. We don't really have to do that right now. I mean, like do we really need to make a bamboo joint? Do we really need to give him the tiger's mouth like that kind of thing? So they were trying to like nitpick the variation that came up with just this one instead. Because if you make the mistake of playing here, you're just screwed. Like if you get too aggressive and you make the mistake of playing here, you're just screwed anyway. But it did mean that there's a lot of leaning variations now in an effort to... Uh, In an effort to settle, there are some leaning variations here now where cuts are involved or some leaning variations where no cuts are involved and instead we're just going to get some shape instead. Those are definitely a thing. And pretty straightforward. I think that about covers it up for the variations you're probably going to see. Does anyone have any variations that they see in their games that I have not gone over today? So I can't think of any, but I kind of feel like I'm missing one. kind of feel like there's one that I just... I just can't remember. We went over the simple. We went over clumpy. We went over pincer too far. Normal pins are close. We went over normal stuff. Kick at R3 a lot is a little bit too soon, I think, Ryota. When your opponent um, tries to play here. Yeah, this is a little bit too, uh, usually a little bit too early. I mean, you could do something like. I mean, you have to play it here. Otherwise, if you play it here, you're gonna get, you're gonna miss your chance. One common mistake I found, or arguably a mistake, was opponent goes after territory, or goes to, uh, goes after influence rather, and then we go back into kick, thinking, oh yeah, free move, right? But it doesn't really have to be, because there are things you could do here to make this a pain in the butt. I mean, you live, and that's great. And now we can reduce. But maybe you didn't really want to be surrounded. But the minute you kicked, you kind of accepted that fate as one possibility that could befall you because you did not extend out. Your opponent will try to get in, get Sente, and then surround you. Right? I see this as well. This is also a classic mistake because now there's an 
now you're just asking to be invaded. It's like you've got a weak point at one, you've got a weak point at two. This isn't territory, this is hopes and dreams. And if you don't know how to take advantage of that, you could quite literally play nothing but this and still be pretty well off. Right? Because we can make shape there very, very fast. Quick, easy, no fuss, no muss. Anyone else have any other variations they see a lot that I haven't gone over? I think someone asked what if B plays P5 or O4. I'm not sure where they asked that. Um... Oh god, to this? Yeah, I have seen that too. Just just get a base. I mean, you've got this as a potential later on. Yeah, you could just get a base here. Whatever. I don't I don't think this is a particularly good idea. Um moves like this pretty much the same thing. If they just back off this way, just get yourself a base because you get to attach later, so that's fun. Like, this is a thing that gets to occur if you're strong on the outside then later on in the future. It could be played. You see F5? No, we went over F5. Influence variation here. Into F5 goes into this. We already went over this, right? Because this can be invaded. I think it's playable, mind you. I think it's playable, but this is going to get reduced hard. Your two options here are reduce it hard before it grows, or to build and just keep an idea of what the score is here and don't let them get too much. Because it is easy for this to like grow out of control. Oh, F5 by Y. I don't know. Now you're inviting yourself to be surrounded. Mm. And you're getting rid of the, the in, I don't know, the invasion's gone. Mm. I don't know. I'm on the fence about that. When invasion's gone, we might get surrounded now. Feels a little bit bad, man. This might have been a bit too early, I think. Yeah. White Q6, black R5? Oh, maybe it is. Maybe not that one, no. Maybe it was this one. Yeah, yeah. When they try to take territory this way, you could obviously have choices of leading to get uh, shape. This is certainly a possibility. Also possibility is just going and getting here. Because if your opponent tries to attack, we can keep getting shape. Before going back and answering. Before just flat out invading. So in this particular case, we tried to back off into a flexible shape. Our opponent said no dice. We said I insist. Opponent said, are you sure about that? We threatened to surround, saying, yep, absolutely. And then we just go and grab the influence, because the influence here defeats the influence of the Kobayashi. Quite effectively, it affords us even easier invasion points, and happy day. But I think that pretty much covers up most of the common variations of the Kobayashi. Sad to say, you will be seeing them in your games, I imagine. Especially if we keep seeing them in the pro level, because that usually is the way it works. 
Hope you guys enjoyed this, and I will see you next time. Take care, everybody.